Well, hello, Wayfinders. Today, we're going to explore the vastness of Eberron. Whether it's taking an airship to the dead gray mists of the Mornland, or hopping on a lightning rail and seeking out the freedoms of the Brelanders. Perhaps you would like to commit your post-life to the undead workforce of Karnath. All of these pleasures are made manifest as we rise from the last war in Eberron on WebDM. This week's sponsor is Hero Forge. They're masters of customizable miniatures and they are rolling out Hero Forge 2.0 on Kickstarter right now. They're going full color. No more unpainted minis. If you back it, you'll be first in line to get your custom minis printed in high quality colored plastic or you can get them professionally hand painted. Get your custom minis exactly how you want them. No work required. It's awesome. This Kickstarter just opened and they've got early bird specials going on now. So check it out. Link here and in the comments and description. All right, Jim. Mm. Let us rise from the last episode of WebDM, oh. the constant war against disinformation yeah. in the tabletop role-playing yeah. game, yeah. to review Eberron, Eberron. Rise from the last war. I was hesitantly eager to see this book. Yeah, Eberron has a special place because I was really into D&D &D at the time it came out. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I, I sort of felt like, oh wow, I get to be present for like a new campaign setting that D&D's making. Yeah. Little did oh. I know it'd be like the second to last one they would make in forever. Yeah, because like... <laughs> yeah, we were like, I, the, what, the heart of third edition? Yeah, 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 I was like third edition, so this is where I got 2002, 2003, I, I think they, uh, the first book was in like 2004, right, right when like 3.5, the mm -hmm. switch from third to 3.5 was coming around. And so, I, yeah, I can remember looking at like the brochure for it, the you know, the preview brochure, and it's like halflings on dinosaurs and the lightning rail and airships mm -hmm. and and pulp action and like it captured my imagination in terms of what it could offer and and has informed so much about how I world build in D and D since then in terms of like level demographics and what constitutes epic and world spanning and and just like the moral ambiguity of the place, the fact that alignments are, are magically imposed on some beings, but for the most part are not really, it's not really a thing. Yeah. You know, and there's a whole nation of necromancers. Sure, <laughs> right, yeah, ruled by a vampire and, 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 and so many things. And like everywhere you'd, I would look, there would be a whole other like secret organization working behind the scenes to do something that I hadn't read about yet. And, uh, you know, all the various uh, higher level uh, and cosmic threats that are tied into its unique cosmology and history and the draconic prophecy and yada, yada, yada. It's just like this. There's a lot of promise. Fully realized, yes, a lot of promise. And also like a, a world in which there hasn't really been an advancement to it, right? Like the world is presented in the 3.5 Eberron campaign setting is the same one presented here. Mm -hmm. It's the same one in fourth edition. You know, they emphasize different parts. They flesh out different areas of it more, but it's still a few years after the last war. Yeah. We're in that period of espionage and intrigue and the like that's supposed to evoke the sort of feel of the lead up to the second world war, the twenties and thirties of, of spying and, and uh, you know, of a powder keg being rearmed. Right, uh, right. Like, Everybody going to their corners. <laughs> yeah. Get taking a breath. You know, a long period of instability followed by uh, you know a period of relative prosperity. But there's so many seeds of conflict embedded in the game that you could probably run can you know games out of Eberron for the next you know the rest of your life and you wouldn't touch on the same themes because you're dealing you know with I don't know independent movements in the Western Eldine reaches uh, mm -hmm. you know uh, uh, you know or uh, orc gatekeepers in the the Shadowlands trying to keep some cosmic threat at bay or sovereign like sovereign rights for the warforged sovereign rights for the warforged or what to do with all the siren uh, you know refugees in, inhabiting Eastern Breland it's just all of that you know uh, you know politics and what to do with the armies of, of all of these nations that have been at war with each other. How do they go back to trusting each other? And like, it's, it's just so much. And if anything, this, the book itself, because we are talking about the book, not just the campaign setting, um, uh, is packed with information. Yeah, and that it, is definitely a positive. Definitely a positive. It, it, it's, it takes a while to work through, and we're still working through it even in terms of just like digesting everything and how would we use it. But um, it's one of the more denser, uh, uh, what you call conceptual density 
Mm -hmm. Something is on every page, if not multiple somethings. <clears throat> and the way it's kind of laid out and presented, there, it, it, a lot of the useful stuff that you would use to prep your game is sort of spread out a bit more than I would like. But it also ensures that if you're just casually flipping through the book looking for inspiration or something uh, to, uh, to hook an adventure with, it's, it, you're, you're spoiled for choice yeah. uh, in terms of that. Now, uh, obviously, our perspective here is one of, of sort of looking at the book uh, as its own thing. We're not really going to talk much about Wayfinder's Guide or Morgrave Miscellany, although I'm sure both of those products uh, would be helpful uh, in either customizing this or, uh, or whatnot. Um, you know, the, not necessarily a comparison between those or, or itself like an in-depth review of everything that's in Eberron just because the book is so... Yeah, it's a, it's, it's quite a bit, but you did you did start with uh with layout the layout yeah, presentation. Yeah, yeah. So I'm talking about some of the layout presentation on it. Yeah, like you said, uh, it's probably a little bit more spread out, but it does um it does kind of flow like D and D books do. Certainly, right, right, right. right. I mean, it's kind of it kind of starts with the races and stuff, and then there's some yeah there's some stuff for the backgrounds and, and mm -hmm. the houses, and then it moves on to just the world, and then you finally yeah. get to you know sort of the DM tools chapter. Yeah, yeah it's, in that sense, the just the overall layout of it hasn't really changed from the uh, sort of the fifth what's probably going to be the fifth edition formula for that kind of thing, mm -hmm. uh, where character stuff is more in in the front loaded uh, and like character creation chapters rather big. We've got you know all the new races as well as commentary on what each of the races are, uh, you know what they represent. One of the neat things is just uh, really spelling out, say, the difference between the three different kinds of elves and how they differ from each other, um, and and the fact that say drow in this are not the outcast evil, you know, uh, heretics of elvish society. They're just another kind of elf from a different part of the world. Yeah, and have you know less contact with with other kinds, and or or you know really digging into what uh, like a Zilagro gnome, you know, what their life is like, what their culture is like, mm -hmm. how to avoid, you know, sort of negative stereotypes that can come from saying like, oh, everybody from this country is a scheming, <laughs> you know, whoever, yeah. but. Also, like they're the the place they come from, they there's a lot of backstabbing and feuding. It could it, lose an arm. Could lose an arm, certainly. So it goes from races to uh, 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 to the dragon marks and how they uh, how they work, which are basically uh, if if you have a, a race that doesn't have a sub race, then the dragon mark kind of like just gives you a variant uh, race on that. But if you've got a sub race associated, then you would pick uh, the dragon mark associated with that. So you'd be an elf of shadow. Uh, as opposed to say in high elf uh, or something, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, and in that sense, like uh, we'll, we'll get to like really what what the dragon marks are here in just a minute. But that's just sort of the big meaty players chapter. <laughs> you get the uh, background, artificer class, a big section on group patrons before moving on to the gazetteer and running adventures uh, in it. And then of course the book closes with. Uh, sections on magic items and monsters. Uh, monsters and the like. So it's pretty standard mm -hmm. in that sense. There's no uh, leaps and bounds or innovations in terms of informational layout or presentation. It's, it's still pretty standard fifth edition mm -hmm. prose mixed with art, mixed with tables, uh, with various fonts and the like, uh, uh, separating information. So I, as someone who's like really loves the the small press boutique uh, kind of RPG products that are obsessively designed and you know it's meant like everything you need to do this one thing is on these this pay, two page spread you don't need to flip over anything or yeah. the character sheets that have all the information you need on them it keeps the same mindset so it, yeah you know. it's got the same trade dress same mindset it looks like the rest of the fifth edition books in that sense it's probably what you expect I will say though that the Sharn chapter I find very well laid out and organized and the, especially the use of tables to summarize the incredible amount of information <laughs> that's contained in it. And, and for a city like Sharn, uh, which is like a megalopolis of a fantasy city, fantasy city, it's helpful to have those. Yeah. So I like that. Well, while we're on that subject, uh, the like lore and info. Yeah. Right. 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 What are what are some of the highlights for you about uh, the lore and info? The lore and info, I would say, the highlight is really the first chapter, which I think is a great introduction to mm -hmm. the setting. If if you're new to Eberron, this is a really good book. Uh, if this is your first experience with Eberron, you, you really just know it as that setting that's kind of like Ravnica that people really like to argue about artificers on, 
<laughs> or Warforged or something. Let's pick this one up if, if you're if you're interested in that. If if you liked what say Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica had, but you thought it was a bit too over the top, then maybe Eberron is, is the place for you there. If you came on board with Eberron in fourth edition or third, then you probably will find something that you don't like about the book. You know, they're making changes. They're adapting everything to the new rule set, to the new style of play that the rule set encourages. And, and so, for instance, there's no action points, like right. there used to be that kind of thing. Um, and, and uh, you know, just the mage right is an NPC, uh, you know, stat block, not a potential NPC class you can sort of build. Little changes like that. But overall, the lore is still the same. And the first chapter really goes into sort of like what makes Eberron unique? What, what makes this place different? Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of things that make it unique. The, the fact that it's explicitly we don't use alignment and that, that villains here often have very sympathetic motivations and are often mm -hmm. in the right context your allies uh, or, or something. That, that people are complicated and, and have complicated motivations and sometimes ulterior motivations. And so it, it has just a lot of really good advice for running games that center around the pulp action genre with noir intrigue mm -hmm. and, and, and really hammer home the fact that this is, this is not high adventure in a fantasy world the way, say, Forgotten Realms is or something like that. This is gritty intrigue and, yeah. and de back dealing. Wait, so. wait, so there's moral ambiguity? Yeah, yeah, you can have evil gold dragons. And there's the fact that these nations of, of, of civilized people have been at war with each other for so long and unleashed weapons and magic that are terrible, right? They created the Mornland, right? Yeah. Uh, and and, and uh, drove out a, a, a people from their nation, uh, you know, through the use of, of this, um, you know, weaponized magic industrialized, weaponized magic. Mm -hmm. um, Probably it, what would happen, the reason the Forgotten Realms never have progressed, because uh, right, like, yeah, yeah, we yeah. don't need to go there. Or, or that's like what the Netherese did, and then they, yeah. they ruined it for everybody else. Yeah, right? everybody else is like, nah, we're good. We'll just right. stay in our armor. And... It goes without saying that almost all of these topics, there is a third edition hardcover out there that covers them in much more detail. But my favorites uh, from that era are Five Nations, which should detail the five human nations uh, of Corvair and go to re really great detail on them. Uh, and um, uh, The Last War uh, is also a good one. I forget what the actual title of it is. There's like something, something of The Last War, and it really goes into what was The Last War like, and you know how could you run campaigns set in The Last War, and, and the like. Um, but there were plenty of others, ones on magic, and the different continents, uh, and the like. So, uh, oh, as well, Sharn is the other, uh, my third of the big uh, third edition books. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Sharn book is really, um, really cool. But um, as opposed to just the rest of the lore and info, like there's no advancement of the timeline, there's no meta plot, there's nothing like that. If you're familiar with the campaign setup from you know the the campaign setting in third or fourth edition, then you'll be familiar with it here. As usual, the lore and just the writing of it's very evocative. They do a very good job of. of of portraying the setting through evocative descriptions and the like, and so in that sense, it's helpful to read as a DM. Um, but you know, like I said, if you're looking for something uh, exhaustive, highly detailed, this one isn't it. The the gazetteer in here uh, for a setting book is rather short, um, but does hit the highlights, which is really what you need, right? Like one of the things they mention in the advice on just running games in Eberron is high stakes and and to uh, let consequences build up to bigger consequences. And in that mm -hmm. sense, the backdrop for those places doesn't need to be mundane. The backdrop for those places needs to be as grandiose and, 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 uh, and high stakes as the action. So in that sense, I kind of like it. If you're going to go to one, you know, if you're going to go to a place, take an airship uh, out in the middle of nowhere, then set it against someplace iconic, someplace fantastic. You're gonna to need to definitely have a travel montage with a red line yeah. going across if you're in your giant airship. <laughs> Absolutely, and, yeah. Uh, really it, grab that feel. Right, yeah, it's one of those things where it's like, if I was Wizards, I might be like, yeah, you can get like a digital pack with a bunch of maps and tokens and things for your Roll20 <laughs> game to do the Indiana Jones map. The one thing about the Lord Info that still leaves me scratching my head is the lack of firearms outside of the Artificer's Artillerist mm -hmm. uh, class. There are even pictures uh, in, in there of, of uh, various characters with like what look like flintlock <laughs> and other sort of first uh, generation firearms, second generation, but yeah. 
Yeah, it seems like in a setting that everything else is advanced magically, at least. Yeah. That you would have something. Something. If only we, you would have something that has the, carries the destructive power with the ease of use. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I, 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 firearms are just one of those things that uh, a lot of DMs are very particular on. It's an aesthetic choice for a lot of uh, tables. Yeah, Bron, it's easy to replace them with like, you know, lightning wands and other sort of contraptions. Mm-hmm. I just include firearms as a, yeah. you know, alchemical, pro- alchemical weapon. I did the lightning wand thing with my one main character from Eberron. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we worked through it all together and how it works and how many charges and all that. At the end of the day, it was just a gunslinger. Right, yeah. Yeah, basically. I, you know, the artilleryist uh, artificer in that sense, uh, you know, filled that role pretty well, I think. Mm-hmm. So that's that's it for, like, the lore and, and info, you know. I you know, My favorite parts of Eberron are the parts where they differ from... Um, from baseline D&D. And, yeah. and sort of the, the central ethos of Eberron is that if it's in D&D, it's in Eberron, but it does not mean that it's, like, presented the same. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and the, the traditionally uh, evil and, you know, uh, uh, antagonistic humanoid races of most D&D settings are a really good place to see that. The fact that for thousands of years or however long the, the goblinoids of uh, the Dakani Empire ruled everything and it was their uh, fight against these psychic creatures from you know another dimension and and, and the slog of, of fighting off those invasions time and time again and the cost that it you know took on them that causes their empire to collapse causes them to to sort of like uh, not regress but become a bit more savage and just mm-hmm. less organized uh, you know so they basically fought Cthulhu. <laughs> these, these beings known as the Dalkir, uh, which I, are are not one of the the, the big uh, enemies that I ever really focused on, but I think that might change this time around, just because I'm way more into like flesh grafts and and you know artificial synthetic magical organs and the like, which they're all about as well. Uh, <laughs> well, if you're grafting flesh, you know, it's, yeah. You yeah. can lend someone a hand. The orcs are similar. You know, the mm-hmm. orcs are, uh, if I'm not mistaken, like one of the founders of the druidic traditions, or at least one of the druidic traditions, and take it as a point of pride that they have fought to defend Eberron, which is uh, the name of both the setting and the world and the mythical dragon that actually makes up the world. Uh, <laughs> and, right. you know, they are they t- take a point of pride in that. And in that sense... Um, you know, if you're looking at ways to portray orcs, goblins, uh, and other humanoids in ways that are, you know, they are products of a culture, not magical manipulation or gods or something like that. Uh, Eberron's a really good uh, place to start with that and take inspiration from it. You know. Yeah, yeah. There's there's plenty of people to hate otherwise. Certainly. Uh, let's move on to some uh, some of the game mechanics. Yeah, the meat uh, and potatoes. The meat and potatoes of it, which I have a couple things to say. Like I said, we didn't want to draw comparisons, but the Warforged in this. I'm just not as gung ho about. Sure. I did. I liked the subclasses yeah. to show that there are different kinds of builds for a war. Oh, forge. sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. The, I actually like the integrated armor. I yeah. thought it just made sense for a being that is built. Right, right, right. That's one thing, and also the the fact that they're living <laughs> humanoids. Yeah, that like, I mean, yeah, that the, the armor thing, I, I I can see why. I you know, the compromise of, the, of integrated plating is it's a compromise. Yeah. You, you know, not what you want, but it's acceptable. It's the um, healing magic, medicine skill, and and the like, still working on them because they're living. And I just I'm trying to wrap my head. like what part of the part of, what part of them is organic. For those things to work on, and like, are they you know like what I mean? Grievous? Like, are you just casting it on their hearts and lungs and throat? Yeah, whose hearts and lungs and everything are those? Like, that's what I'm. I know why. And this is one of the things about fifth edition that 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 gets under my skin the most, is that Let there you. there are clearly things that are done in the name of making life easier for the party. It's convenience, yeah. Convenience, and I just they make me want to pull my hair out sometimes because it's like. Wait a minute. It, it it'd be way easier for a DM to like draw those back as opposed to introduce them in. I think uh, the elements of convenience. You know, other examples of this would be the way that rangers obviate like nearly all outdoor challenges, 
or you know similar with like outlanders and all the different spells that are basically like nope i don't want to have to worry about food or i don't want to have to worry about the enemy sneaking up on me and um I, you know to me as a dungeon master i look at those things and i go well those are points of conflict and tension that i used to be able to use to drive a game forward mm -hmm. not so much anymore uh and and i look at it with like the warforge and it's like well if someone with the medicine skill can just come up and roll a die and stabilize a warforge, then they're not a construct. They're a creature yeah. that happens to have metal and on wood. Them and wood on them. <laughs> like, what part of it does the medicine skill work on? Because medicine's a wisdom and intuition based thing, not a logic and technical skill based thing. So if I, thing. Break, if I break my sword, can you cast Cure Wounds on my sword? They don't want to have, uh, have people have to cast a different spell other than Cure Wounds. And I, yeah. my opinion on that is, yeah, you've got to cast a different spell because it's a different kind of creature. Well, either that or you, that's why you have somebody with blacksmith's tools. Sure. Because that's what we did in Starward Bound with E404, the Warforged there. I asked, yeah. I asked Kian at the beginning, I was like, do you want just normal healing to work? And she was like, kind of don't. And I'm like, okay, well, it's yeah. half as effective. Yeah. Whatever you roll, it only works a little bit on the because sure. it's the magic of it yeah, yeah. that's yeah. kind of knitting you together. But it, but yeah. then uh, the cleric, yeah. who was also a dwarf and was good with blacksmithing tools, yeah. would then have to get in there with the <laughs> hammer and the chisel yeah. and straighten some shit out. Straighten some shit out, yeah. I, I, you know, I can see changing a creature type is a big deal. There's really not anything that you play in... in uh, in fifth edition, that isn't a humanoid. You know, they, it, certain magic might not work if they were not living humanoids. Uh, you know, if they were constructs, think of all the things that they would be that they would not be subject to just by the fact they're constructs. So I get it. It's just I feel like it is not firmly established in the fictional universe how this works, and it gets under my skin. Yeah, it feels lazy. It feels like it's not thought through, and it feels like it exists solely as a metagame conceit and not as like fidelity to the setting. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, it's a nitpick. <laughs> but it, like I said, it gets, it gets under my skin. I would certainly argue for a DM to be like, hey, can I just not? For you, what's uh, game mechanics? What do, you, what do you like, what do you not like? The other races, I like the take on them. They, they, they are what you would expect them to be. If changelings couldn't alter their appearance whenever they want it, then they wouldn't be changelings. I, do I wish it was a bonus action instead of an action? Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, if only because I find, uh, you know, an action for that is, is rather costly, but when I really start thinking about it, how often am I gonna use it in a situation where my action economy really is being stretched to the limit? You mm -hmm. know, most of the time when I use something like a shape change, it's gonna be in a stealth or espionage or exploration type thing. You know, it's, I got actions to spare. Um, the, one of the things that gets me about uh, Kalashtar is mostly that it doesn't seem like they would make good scions whenever they finally introduce a psionic class. And that kind of just bothers me because it's like I always sort of saw them. As, I mean, they're telepathic. They've got this sort of planar origin. There's, they're mystical and, and, and sort of otherworldly. And I kind of am just like, well, but no int? You know, I... This is one of the and Clashstar in particular, scratch. Are, sure. And Clashstar <laughs> in particular are one of those where I just like I never really paid attention to them in the other times I've done Eberron. I've been way interested in other things, and and Eberron is so big and there's so much to it. You really can focus on just a little bit and be like, I have no idea what's going on with that thing. Yeah, yeah. Even though it's a player's option, um, so it could be that I'm way off base. And that it's always been like this, and that this is fine. Uh, and you know, it's more my expectations that are that are off. And then finally, shifters are are one of those where I love shifters. I love the idea of them. I like including them in my games. But most of the execution that I've seen, at least in uh, now fifth and then in third, has just left me going. Well, I just they need something else. Yeah. Like they just, I feel like they need something. Kind of like Ganassi, right? Where it's like, yeah, this checks all the boxes. I, I'm an elemental being. I am an animal type being, you know, uh, for shifters. I mm -hmm. can, you know, I've got lycanthrope uh, heritage, but yeah, yeah. can I just a little bit more? Just something else? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so... Uh, I remember Jim. Hmm. It's Jonasi. Is I don't know that it <laughs> is. I don't know that it is. You know, you guys can think whatever you want. You're free to be wrong, and I'm free to be whatever I want to be. How do they give you all kinds of stuff for the other so races? How do you feel about those dragon mark houses and how they uh, decided to do that? Do you want me to go ahead and get, go get you a soapbox? Or? Yeah, we got, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I am, this is the part of the book I'm most dissatisfied with. 
And, and I did not dive deep into Wayfinder's Guide. I was not a part of the, the you know, I didn't get upset when it seemed like we were buying playtest rules. And, and I, you know, I'm just, I wasn't. Uh, uh, but I liked what they were doing with Dragon Marks there. I, I really liked uh, where they were headed. I thought it was going to be interesting. And, uh, you know, and I probably would use those uh, or incorporate something of them. Because as they stand, the Dragon Marked, houses now are a, an option for uh, your race and if you've got uh, you know if your race has sub race options you can pick a dragon mark uh, to be one, uh, that instead and if there is no sub race option like say human or uh, half orc then you just get a variant in that sense i don't have a problem with that there's no more feats associated with dragon marks which mm -hmm. i can get it not everybody plays with feats except for aberrant uh, dragon marks um but it's the fact that the increased, uh, you know, the, the magical abilities of the Dragon Mark houses, which were to me always the hallmark of the setting, is that some people have access to magic without being users of it. Some people yeah. have access to magic without being sorcerers, without being wizards, without being clerics, without being whatever. They are born with this lineage that gives them a very thematic set, but you cannot access any of that unless you have the spellcasting or packed magic features, which to me completely just, it, it, it really uh, undermines the concept yeah. of the Dragonmark House, which to me was, you don't need a cleric to get healing. You know, you don't need... Just that, go to one was, of the Dragonmark you just, Houses. You go to one of the Dragonmark Houses. Go to House uh, J uh, Jalasco, and they'll, they'll heal you up. Or, or, or you know. be careful before you talk <laughs> crap to that guy on the street, because he might whip out a, a tattoo right, and, yeah. like, cast a spell at you, even though he looks like a peasant. Yes, or a beggar. Yeah, or whatever. Or whatever. Sort of the bounty hunter's house. The, the house of, of they, you know, hunt people down and find them, the inquisitives and the like. Wait, like, part of what was fun about that was that some of these people are just rogues and fighters who who are, you know, they're, they're fighting crime, but they have this magical edge. They've just got a little bit extra, you know. So tying it like that, convenience, sure. Easy, sure. Uh, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> does it accurately represent what the, the lore presents as how these things are? I, I don't think so. And I thought it made sense in, in Ravnica when you got your guild that it just added new spells you could potentially take. But in this sense, I really do think it, it should be something where it's like, yeah, even if you don't cast spells, having access to some actual magic would have been nice. Now, of course, you get other things with it, skills and benefits and, and the like. Uh, you can combine uh, your dragon mark with the house agent background to represent that that person that's very much committed to their dynasty. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is the only background we get, though, house agents. Uh, and while it represents each one of the dragon mark houses, you get some proficiencies and like uh, personality traits. Like, I'm, I'm looking here and I'm like, there's no um, journalist background. Like, they, they're big yeah, deal newspapers about everywhere. Newspapers, <laughs> newspapers, <laughs> clippings. Yeah. They're offered as uh, as one of the group patrons, which we'll gush about in a second. <laughs> There's something like that. There's, I, and I think, like, given the fact that this is a st this is clearly inspired by like steampunk, it's supposed to evoke the period between the two world wars. Like, mm -hmm. I think that we could use some updated backgrounds to reflect the fact that the world of Eberron is fundamentally different than the world of Greyhawk, the world yeah. of Forgotten Realms and others. Come there's no conductors or whatever. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I think Majorite could have easily been a, a background choice. You know, mm -hmm. you are someone who uses your magical powers to, uh, you know, to do this. And maybe Majorite has a thing where it's like, hey, you don't have spells, but you count as having the spell casting feature for the purposes of items and other abilities. Mm. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> it could have been something like that, or it could have been... Uh, you know, that you have access to minor scrolls and the like, uh, if you want. Uh, you know, there's some class options that I think would work as uh, background options here. So, like, Inquisitive is a type of rogue that would work great in Eberron. Oh, yeah, definitely. But you could also just do an Inquisitive as a background, which eh, I think Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide has, like, Watch Commander or something like that. Yeah, yeah. But easy enough to fix with a custom background table, but sort of... Uh, you know, like minorly disappointing not to see more than one. I mean, it's a book already crammed full of so much, so it's not like you're missing out. But it is... Yeah, yeah you probably have enough information to extrapolate your own backgrounds. Yeah. But at least giving, like, just like the player's handbook, at least giving some examples 
in setting so you at least have a starting point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that can be just such a big help to some people. For some people, yeah. And, and I, you know, some ones that I think work really well for, for Evron are, are those that are like archaeologists. Uh, those oh, yeah. backgrounds that suggest a more sophisticated and advanced society. Because yeah. one of the things that I, I really like about Eberron is that it is a, it's a more modern world. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of blank places on the map. Uh, they're on the fringes, um, it, it, you know, but it's not a place where you just like rootless adventurers wander around writing wrongs at the end of their blade. Like you do that enough, the cops are going to come after you. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know somebody's going to be like, why are these people just wandering around killing? And so, um, you know, in that sense, it, it being more modern, it's e more easily to relate to. Um, but it also would mean that there'd be different social groups, mm -hmm. different professions, different... Uh, well, different enough reasons to, to have uh, some more backgrounds. But, like I said, minor nitpick. Group patrons, though. Oh, yeah. It's one of those things where the last three releases we've really dug into, with the exception of Avernus, uh, the, but Ravnica and Ghost of Salt Marsh, there's been something in them that I've just been like, yes, this needs to be in every other book. This, you know, this, the, this, is, this is the contribution this book made right. to 5th edition, and I really think the group patron is that for Eberron. Um, it, it is a, it, it's, for one, it's as big a section as the rest of the character creation section. Like, it's this huge chunk of tools for both of the players to kind of, like, find ways to have a, a, a theme that binds their group. Yeah. Uh, and, and to find ways to sort of, like, fit into the world easier. But it's also a section for the dungeon master to come in there and go like, all right, well, we guys are all part of a, you know, a, a, an immortal being. You know, that's your group patron or whatever. Let's see what this says. What kind of adventures does that mean? How does this affect you? Uh, as, as a tool for bringing a group together, giving them united purpose, giving them motivation and, and just cohesion and therefore encouraging player investment and the like, especially combined with the rest of the stuff in the book. Man. It is really cool, and, yeah. and I, I really hope uh, that the adventures and the like uh, and the other material for, uh, for Eberron really uh, play up on that mm -hmm. and, and play into the fact that there's group patrons. And it really, like, <laughs> between the group patrons and the faction rules in Ravnica, really makes me think, like, you could combine these two books. They're very complementary despite the, uh, you know, the fact that they're two different places and the lore is different. Uh, yeah, the, the GM support stuff is very much uh, complimentary. Well, I mean, it could be that the uh, effect of the last war was actually like porting in this city. Oh, from yeah, another dimension. sure, yeah. Like you could, there's a lot of and instead of creating the Mornland, now that's yeah. where Ravnica sits. It could be that it could be a suburb of Sharn that, mm -hmm. that that that's just recently cropped up. You know, went down there one day. I'm like, where did this come yeah, from? Yeah, where did this come <laughs> from? Yeah. Just, Chop it up and, and use yeah, it the, for the, pieces. But, but the whole the the, the intrigue and yeah, uh, yeah. all of that, it's yeah. just it, it fits mm -hmm. right what right in there. Yeah, yeah. So those sections of Ravnica that are like how to construct adventures for your for your factions that you belong to, the guilds. I mean, you could easily, without a lot of alterations, uh, use those tables and those that advice for like say running uh, games of intrigue for the houses or like you're in uh, what's it called Thronehold. And it's, you know, you're there uh, protecting the secrets that are coming about from the negotiations uh, that are ending the last war, those mm -hmm. kind of things. Um, and if you combine that with chapter four of Eberron, which is the uh, running adventures in Eberron chapter, which is another really good resource for ideas, structure, enemies, uh, you know, it, it's one of those things where I'm, I'm glad that Wizards of the Coast seems to have embraced the uh, the use of randomizers and random procedural generators that the OSR and indie game community has because the OSR and indie game community have really shown people like here's the right way to do this like you can do you can use these random tables in a way that makes for a really mediocre session but here's how you use them to enhance to build to provide structure to do uh, you know, to en engage with the players. I've tried to run several Emberon games, mm -hmm. right? And every one of them, what stumps me is the fundamentally different nature between a, uh, you know, what you get up to in a regular D&D game. Yeah. Kick in the door, take the loot, slay the enemies, that kind of thing, versus the kind of pulp adventures that Eberron has. And every time I've run it, I've struggled to come up with what I felt was a uniquely Eberron experience. 
that I, you know, whatever games, however many we were able to get in, they weren't terrible, they weren't awful, you know, but I felt that they weren't aligned with the world well enough. Mm -hmm. And when I was reading through both the group patron section and then chapter four, as well as parts of the Sharn uh, chapter, I was just struck by how useful all of this was, how, how uh, you really are given a lot of tools for running this. And given the size of the rest of the book, there's so much that you can use to supplement those tools. I, I was really uh, impressed with that. In terms of game mechanics and support, maybe it's not what you're looking for. Maybe yeah. it's not perfect or the way you envision it, but it's a solid base to make your own changes. So before we move on to the last section, I think we at least have to talk about the Artificer. Yes, we do. Yes, um, we do. What do you want to say? Well, I mean, <laughs> as the Artificer has evolved, um, it's not it's not terrible. I don't like I don't mind it. Yeah. I, I mean, I've always been more of an artillerist anyway, mm. Um, mm. and so the fact that uh, for the most part they they kind of you have the the, the, the wand capabilities there, yeah, yeah. Um, and you have the big ass gun if you want it. Yeah. Um, I, I mean. It's there. You it's can there. have it. It's there. The infusions are fun, even though the what's the one infusion they took away? The, uh, uh, the, well, the, the 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 pouch of many pockets. Pouch of many got pockets. Is, is got, <laughs> that was always any artificer that I dreamed up. It's like, well, yeah, you would have that. Yeah. I need to just be able to, uh -huh. you know. Uh -huh. They um, still have the the boots, uh, like the seven league boots, or whatever they're called, or boots of the winding path. They oh, still have that one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Yep. Um, <laughs> but the the introduce introduction of the battlesmith. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I like that, but I want it to go further. I want it still, I'm sure, sorry, yeah, as an yeah. artificer, I need to make I need to make a suit of armor. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like I want to make a you goblin make armor, yeah. in an Iron Man suit. Yes. You know, that kind of shit. Yeah, like I still yeah. want to be able to do that. And maybe you could work with your DM uh, to make that a thing. Yeah, I think you could. I think you could. Especially if you like you picked up the armor proficiency from somewhere or uh, or you took like the um, oh, what's it called? The Mazinium, uh, the magic armor from Ravnica. That, well, this is why you make a hobgoblin. Uh, yeah, that, or you could make a hob. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, well, you can go ahead and get that from. <laughs> yeah, that intelligence bonus. Yeah, uh, uh -huh. but hobgoblins make really nice artificers. Anyway. I'm sad that the oh, what was the one in the play test that the could, homunculi thing? Not well, the one that cre could create ar arcane intelligences. The archivist, maybe something like there was one in in like the last one of the second to last. Uh, Expansions for the artifice, or where they, they introduced the battlesmith. Yeah, I, it, I've, we've, there were so many, so many. UAs right, yeah, yeah, that that's true. It's all, I, yeah, it got squished out of my brain sponge. So yeah, there's one where it's like you know, I, I saw them as connected to Warforge. They are the the you know the ones that maybe either discovered or fostered the sort of uh, developing of intelligence and sapience for the Warforge. Mm -hmm. um, I like them, but they are a bit high concept for for the setting. Um, but I, I am sad. About about the homunculus becoming an infusion, if only because the other two classes still have a pet, uh, alchemist doesn't anymore. The way that the action economy works, it's like it's not like an artilleryist or battlesmith's going to pick up the homunculi infusion. Probably not. I mean, they could, but it would it would clash when you were wanting to get the most out of your action economy. And I also like it's a homunculus. Like, how else do you make them but you, the use of alchemicals? Mm -hmm. You know, like it didn't bother me that the alchemist had a weird little gross thing that followed them around. I kind of like that. It was very Rick Sanchez. Yes, for <laughs> one. Uh, but I also recognize that my conception of the alchemist is not what most people's are. And I think really most people's conception of the alchemist is someone that throws vials of acid at people and burns them. Like, it just, like, they throw chemicals at people <laughs> in glass vials. <laughs> Which if I was gonna do, yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah, that's, and that's that's a rough visual. Yeah, and um, I just it's it's not it's not my bag. I I much prefer the I'm bubbling up something and I made this thing. Who's helping me? Yeah, you know, uh, or I drank a bunch of potions and I went to bed and I got a tummy ache and then when I had a spit up, this came out. You drink your homunculi <laughs> and throw yeah. them up in the morning. I call them hangover. Yeah, there's a variant of homunculi and. Um, in Cobalt Press's Tome of Beasts, where you grow them inside your body and then have to get them out <laughs> before <laughs> they get before rowdy. they get themselves out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I like That's grotesque disturbing. things like that. Um, but yeah, the Artificer, like, it's not. It doesn't have a lot of raw power to it. I think you know, you you, you don't you're not getting like nine full spells, nothing like that. 
uh, I think that there are a lot of details to work out with mm -hmm. the way that your tools actually perform the magic. Yeah, yeah. But that's for your DM and you to work out. But you're still like, I think what the, what they're there for is to have a broad spectrum, Very broad spectrum of, yeah. of magic uh, at your disposal, yep. whether it's a thing that you built, some spells that you have, some infusions that you can do. Yeah. Items that you can create. Yes. Um, yeah. And just that, I mean, shit, man, I'm sorry, but still that last ability of like whatever your, whatever infusions you have on you, which at that time I think you can have six. Up to six, yeah. Two, plus yeah. six on all your saves. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, yeah. okay. There's a lot of fun stuff. There's a lot of fun combos. There's yeah. a lot of, uh, it's it's a versatile class. Yeah, and, and that, it's more it, versatility over raw power. Yeah, and, and traditionally in D&D, &D, that can be a trap that can signal that you're making a character that's not... Um, you know, that might be weak in the sense of, you know, power gaming sense. Um, but I think the the versatility of the artificer doesn't lead to weakness. I, th I think it's a class where if you're if a player's willing to put the time and effort into coming up with clever combos and oh, being yeah. adaptable, this is a thinking person's class in the sense that you want to work your way around problems and, and come up with uh, you know gear and technological based solutions. That can be really fun. So let's move on to the last little section here of our, yeah. our of our overview. How do you see this book presenting the look and the feel of Eberron? Yeah, yeah. Because I think that it actually does a pretty damn good job. I think so too. And, and one of the one of the things I really liked about um, you know the Eberron campaign setting in third edition was these sort of one page comic book type spreads, mm -hmm. where you know there'd be like uh, you know the big page and then like a couple of insets and then like some sort of text describing what's going on. Yeah. And there's sort of these mini stories that I felt really conveyed the feel. Uh, of Eberron. Those if, pulp comics. Yeah, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. if not like Lind, the, the sort of structures uh, that I like to have uh, before playing a, a game. And I find like the, the art here is similarly evocative, especially the one page, uh, uh, you know, sort of chapter uh, pieces. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the look of Eberronian <laughs> uh, uh, skyships, of airships, is very distinctive with the ring and the struts uh, and the like. Yeah, it's very, very early Vulcan. Uh, yeah, yeah. Vulcan. Yeah. in early Star Trek. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Anyway, y'all know what I'm talking I about. I still don't know that we've seen a, a good piece of like two airships in battle uh, okay. against each other, but I don't. No, uh, I, don't I can't think, really. I, don't I, don't think, I think they fight each other that much, actually. At least uh, that's, uh, that's the a last shame. war. Well, there's so. a lot of things in Last War that I I took a pen to because I was like, no, nah, my airships are definitely fighting each other. You know, yeah. um, I think they ruled they were too expensive, the like to you know, like more like dirigibles in, in World War One than. Um, you know, like big flying ships. Uh, mm -hmm. the second one. Um, Binding the elementals to them is probably pretty tough. Yeah, 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 yeah. You don't want those things to get damaged and have that elemental get loose. But um, I like, you know, the alternate cover in that sense, like has that classic sort of uh, airship. It's got yeah, the man. noir feel. It's very steampunk. And oh, I yeah. do think Eberron, Eberron works well when you lean into that. Oh, like, definitely, definitely. You know, uh, we've got enough pseudo medieval settings out there. We, we mm -hmm. D and D can accommodate a more a more steampunk, magipunk type uh, setting. Yeah, and I like the little little excerpts in the sections on the uh, every country or whatever. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. The little newsy, like the different, like the Gazette. Oh yeah, and the, yeah. The, 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 the Corenberg Chronicle. Yeah, the Chronicle. Yeah. And, uh, oh yeah, the, gives you that that newsy feel. Meanwhile, on the front, you know, like I read, like when I look at that, that voice reads in my head what yeah, I'm reading. Yeah, I, I think think the same way, and and it it further drives home how the place is different. There is mm -hmm. a newspaper. How do you get rumors through the newspaper? Yeah. You know, uh, where are your exploits accounted for, and how are they disseminated front to page, a wider baby. audience? The front page. Front we made the page. front page. <laughs> uh, you know, how do you uh, you know get clued in into the wider happenings of the world, and and where your characters might want to travel five or six levels down the road well you can do that through the newspaper it's a it's a subtle but very effective way for the gm to like convey information mm -hmm. get things to the players like you always have a handy way of doing this well, yeah. we, well we bought an ad in the paper and the cipher will be there on okay. tuesdays -ish. wait i just realized something, you know? <laughs> to some of our audience newspapers oh, yeah. are these paper things that. that have information of the current events <laughs> anyway but yeah, yeah if you're looking for a job if your players looking for something to do be like as the dm be like have you checked the classifieds sure you know yeah. i mean there's wizards and shit in there, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, like, yeah. Lost yeah. one, please return. Right. Reward, we'll give reward. <laughs> I mean, like, you think about all the weird little things that a wizard would normally have you get up to. 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Check the, the paper. The, the classified. Yeah. The Craigslist of of oh, Sharn is a definitely <laughs> a, a fun place to go find adventure. It's very effective in getting across what type of campaign world this is, what type of adventures you're going to have, what how the setting reacts to the fantastic elements that go on in in the setting. I think they're a great uh, great inclusion, and I'm sure there's a lot of hooks uh, and ideas you can get from them. Yeah. Um, other than that, I, you know, the the whole book overall is, you know, it's classic fifth edition sort of standard, but it effectively conveys this idea of a, of a fundamentally different place that mm -hmm. Eberron is, and I think that that's a a, a good thing. I, I was worried about this one, and there's part of the reason why I was hesitant to pick it up because there was a part of me that was like, I really like Eberron, and I don't, you don't want I don't want to be disappointed. <laughs> I don't, you know, I I I, I had picked yeah. up Wayfinder's. Uh, guide but then read about the whole people who are like wait a minute why are we why is this playtest thing and what's you know yeah and and i so that kind of soured me on like really digging into it because i was like oh man <laughs> and and so I, I was hesitant i was i was not really looking forward to it because i was worried that ravnica would, would have been a fluke uh in, in in terms of just how useful and effective i thought ravnica was i kind of was like oh and i saw everybody talking about the artificer and the warforged and this and that which i expected them to but it, it made me go like i'm not really gonna i'm gonna skip this one uh, but it was you guys out there asking about it and you know figure can't ignore it and you know like i said if this is your first time encountering Eberron, then this book's really good for you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you're not, you got your own flavor of Eberron that you like, hopefully this one will be useful if you decide to pick it up. I, I think it can be. Yeah. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. WebDM exists thanks to our Patreon patrons, the Web Demons. If you join the Web Demons, you'll get our weekly podcast, show audio, discounts that'll save you way more than $5 a month on books and dice, and so much more. Check out our free podcast episodes right now, including our free interview with Luke Gygax about all things D&D. If you like our advice for your games, then why don't you come check us out and watch us play? Yeah, we've got games on Twitch every week, and they're archived on our second YouTube channel, WebDM Plays. Thanks for watching. Good. It doesn't reach out and grab me like Anima or Undertow or fucking Ten Thousand Days or Lateralis like like those did. But it's so solid. And then this is what finally did it for me. There's an interview where uh, Maynard uh, said basically like, "Well, that album was perfect eight years ago when we should have just released it then." And I'm like, "Yeah, you should have. You should have. You really should have. Come on, Maynard. Come I know that y'all y'all tend to obsess over fucking bridges for like a month or a year, but maybe you should like go see a doctor." And if you should have put this out a long time ago, and you probably would have made more money. Yeah, yeah sorry if this ever goes on a stinger. But yeah, stop, tool. <laughs> stop, sorry, Tool fans, but they, they're just a band. They're just a band. They're not summoning demons. They're, yeah. I mean, they talk about you know divine geometry and all that shit, and it's fun to talk about because use it makes people... Yeah, use it for your D&D game. But they're not like, there is no grand... You know, but these, these, like, this kind of mentality is the same reason why people like added up all the Marvel movies and they're like, oh my God, it's 3,000 minutes exactly, which is why they did that joke. And everybody's like, uh, no, it's no, not. Yeah. No, no, oh, that's what, they made uh, Spider-Man Far From Home at the exact time that it was because it made the entire Marvel run up, the, the Infinity War saga, 3,000 minutes or some shit like that. And it's just like, uh, yeah, we all liked A Beautiful Mind, but <laughs> it's just, Stop, stop trying to find the golden spiral uh, in everything. I don't know. It's, this is why we can't have nice things. But I do this kind of the same kind of shit, you know. That's why. Yeah. Everybody I, does it. We're looking. We're, we're, we're looking for meaning in an otherwise abstract and uh, insane world. Yeah, I'm sorry. And so. We're also well. I. This is why I don't share anything with anyone. <laughs> oh, like anyone? Well, most people. Uh, certainly. What, what are you talking about? Right now?